Good afternoon, dental internet world. My name is Dr. Vishal Sharma, along with my friend and colleague, Dr. Mike Parchewski, and you're listening to our podcast, Digital Workflow Dentistry, where we discuss utilizing advanced technology in a variety of dental treatments. Mike, nice to see you on this beautiful sunny day that we're having. So, have you uh, planted anything in your garden? Anyways, tell our listeners what you've been implanting and what our topic of conversation is today. Well, good afternoon, Vishal, and good afternoon to our podcast and YouTube listeners. Today, we'll be discussing the usage of an office-fabricated surgical implant guide, and more specifically, how we use the treatment planning for the guide as a case presentation tool. Now, truth be told, I did receive some seats today from Amazon for the garden. But unfortunately, if you want more information on home gardening or horticulture, this is not the podcast for you. All right. So no greenery advice, and I'm assuming uh, we're not discussing hair and plants, but give us a quick summary of what a dental surgical guide is and the benefits of using one in implantology. Well, an implant surgical guide is essentially a customized plastic arch overlay with a metal sleeve that assists the dentist in the effort of placing an implant to the exact ideal position. The benefits are that it can lead to increased accuracy in the, in the placement of the implant and ultimately a longer lasting implant with hopefully less chance of complications. Now understand that a surgical guide is not in place of experience and is not in place of understanding anatomy, understanding biological principles, and understanding those fundamentals about the bone and the gingiva that you need to know to be placing implants. That's a good point, Mike. So in fact, in the uh, relatively near future, we'll be doing a comprehensive webinar on implant placement and the corresponding guidelines. So uh, feel free to check our website, www.digitalworkflowdentist.com for upcoming dates on that. Um, and uh, Mike will uh, will post that link uh, at the end of this podcast as well. So a surgical guide will hopefully aid us in achieving our mantra of APCE, increased accuracy, predictability, improved patient comfort, and efficiency. Yeah, correct. It really guides us on establishing a proper osteotomy drill path, the angulation of that drill path, depth of the implant placement, and it allows us to use a tissue punch or significantly reduce the flap size, which then reduces post-op op, uh, post -op discomfort, but also can reduce um, issues with healing and can help to preserve the uh, attached gingiva as well. Okay, so let's talk about some of the technology that's required to treatment plan the placement of an implant and the creation of the surgical guide. So as I mentioned when our, in our webinar, we'll be discussing the clinical evaluation of gingival phenotype, occlusion, uh, medical history, um, if it's pertinent that the patient might be missing more teeth than some of the characters on Tiger King, you know, the usual clinical circumstances. Well, I'll, let me just say that it's okay if our patients have missing teeth or multiple missing teeth, but it is office policy that we don't allow 300-pound tigers in the clinic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to the technology, Mike. So we utilize a CBCT to determine the bone, the bone volume and to map out anatomically significant landmarks. We're talking the nerve, the sinuses, adjacent roots, osseous deformities, concavities. They, we then are also taking the intraoral scan of the teeth and soft tissue in and around the quadrant where the implant is being placed. Using our software, and in both you know, our cases, we're using either the Galaxis or the Cydexis implant planning software, we bring those two files together, and then we have what we basically have is a merged file of the CBCT and the interall scan together. And so by combining or marrying those files, we get a very accurate assessment of what the subgingival anatomy looks like via the CBCT, and also an extremely precise rendition of coronal tooth structure in the visible gingiva via the intraoral scan. Yeah, exactly. And then what we can then do is utilizing the implant planning software, we're able to choose what implant type, what length we want for the implant, the diameter of the implant, and place it where we feel it to be most ideal. You know, one thing that I should mention is that in this software, we can simultaneously view the implant being placed, virtually of course, in a sagittal, Tan tangential, panoramic, and axial view. So as we adjust the implant angulation, the depth, the bodily position, it simultaneously moves in all the other windows. And so Mike, this enables us to place that implant in a position that best utilizes the patient's bone, avoiding the anatomically sensitive structures that you had uh, previously mentioned, and also it factors in the best occlusal position. So 
in essence, Mike, we're taking a crown down implant approach to steal a term from uh, endodontics. Why is this important? Well, it does enable us to place an implant within the path of insertion of the crown, the adjacent teeth, and also where the bone is, is ideal bone thickness is. Now, by looking at the, the path of insertion and having that meeting those guidelines, we're more often able to use a screw retain restoration as opposed to a cement one. And of course, this is preferable because although cement retain restorations are very effective and have numerous indications, a screw retain restoration signifies two things. One, the risk of cement sepsis is, of course, all but eliminated with the absence of cement. And the second thing is that the mastication forces are now going to be directed down the long axis of the crown and the implant. So that will then reduce any lateral or eccentric forces on the implant and the implant abutment. Yeah, also I'll add that on anteriors now, use, utilizing the angulated screw access holes with the Atlantis abutments, uh, we are able to actually do screw retained on anteriors way more often than was in the past, which is which is also gives us those same capabilities in the front teeth, which I think is great. Yeah, I, I really like that Atlantis system. And in fact, it's one of the focuses of our uh, upcoming webinar. So certainly tune into that. Okay, Mike, we've got an interested patient. Uh, my trusted assistants have taken a CBCT and an intraoral prime scan. We've combined those two images. Walk us through how you simultaneously treatment plan this case and present it to the patient. Well, first, let me say what we're talking about here is the digital implant case presentation system. Mike's very, very proud of that, by the way. I don't know if it's trademarked or if the patent is pending, uh, but let me just quickly interject. Uh, we'll also be uploading to our YouTube channel a video of that workflow, which you created. It's a great video uh, with some snazzy background music. So uh, to view that, please subscribe to our Instagram page at uh, Digital Workflow Dentistry for the links. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. Yeah, and I, I'll, you know, that music, uh, some good uh, solid 80s jazz. Uh, everybody wants to hear that, I think. Um, so basically what we're talking about with the, the digital implant case presentation is that we can actually engage our patient in the workflow in a fast, seamless approach. So we first seat the patient. The assistant takes the prime scan. So now we have a digital representation of their teeth and their gums. Mm -hmm. We design the crown right there. She just goes in, puts the crown in place where the, the tooth is missing. And then we take a low-dose CBCT of that quadrant. She then merges those files into either the Galaxis or the Sidex's implant. And we can now bring this up in front of the patient on the screen. So now we can start talking with the patient live that this is the anatomy that they've got. This is the dimensions, sinus position, nerve location, all those things that we were talking about earlier. We can now do that right in front of the patient live on their own case. Now I can bring up the implant virtually and place it into the missing tooth space and align it to the bone and crown. Now the patient sees, okay, these people know what we're doing. We know where the implant should go. We are avoiding their vital structures like their inferior alveolar nerve or their sinus. And we've We've got the size of the implant and we know where it's supposed to go. And so now the patient's like, okay, well, what's next? And we just say, okay, well, all we have to do next is book a time and, um, you know, we just need to make you a surgical guide and uh, we're good to go. And so literally we're ready to book that patient that day. So the patient's seated in literally in, in 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, we've got the CBCT, you've taken the prime scan, you've presented the case simultaneously treatment planning it. And obviously the patient is on board with that. We're ready for the surgical guide and, and they've got a lot of confidence that they're in the right place uh, with the right dental team. Yeah, and it's absolutely, it has to be, for, especially in implants, one of the best things that we've implemented into our clinic. And, you know, I'll just say at this time, you know, we will not actually treat cases now that don't agree with getting the scan. We are doing low dose, just the quadrant. Um, you know, it's basically the same as a couple PAs. But, you know, if we, you know, if a patient's just coming around, shopping around, you know, saying wants to meet me and say hi or whatever, that's fine. But we're not going to go forward with that case or move to book them for anything unless we have taken that information. So we just don't, we just feel that it's too good of a system and too efficient uh, to not have in our, in our office. Yeah. And I should mention, Mike comes from a very strong surgical background and was obviously placing implants. Uh, long before guided technology was readily available. It's the exact opposite for me, Mike. As you know, uh, the 
entry point for me with placing implants was guided technology. And so, you know, you have to have the skill set to, of course, lay a flap, augment some bone. Uh, but that accuracy and the predictability with the guided implantology is what gave me the confidence to delve into it. And, and same thing with our practice. Invariably, if you're coming in, we're planning it to go guided. And the vast majority of the time, it ends up being uh, very, very successful. Uh, so, you know, we're using predominantly the Astro system in our clinics with uh, Sarah Guide 3 workflow. Uh, is that still your go-to at this time? Yeah. So... The Astra implant workflow and Atlantis abutments, and then going to a milled uh, Syrac crown from the core file, that workflow has been my go-to. And for efficiency, uh, for patient success, gingival health, uh, achieving the biological width and biological parameters that are important. And um, the other thing about the Astra implant system from Dentsply and Serona is that it allows for a profile implant and a regular implant. Um, and both of these platforms have uh, different times where we're using them. But the beauty, beauty about the profile implant is it's actually an implant design that's, that's sloped. So what you can do is if the bone in, in the scenario you're working on is angled, rather than in the past where you'd have to either grind that down or you would submerge the implant and then grind the excess bone, um, or some people would just submerge it and you'd have just a weird sort of biological width happening, um, you can actually put that implant in a place where it sort of matches the, the alignment of the bone. And it could be in a scenario like a lower molar where we quite see that often where it heals often trails off to the buckle. Um, but even if you had a case because of a difficult extraction or something that you had the opposite, or let's say mesial distally that the, you are having a defect, you can put the implant in any 360 degree position with the angulation. So I have found it has been you know, an implant that when I heard about, it, I thought, oh, that's kind of gimmicky. You know, when we started using it, I'm like, we are all of a sudden we're, we're reordering that implant more often than the others, because more often than not, now that I'm paying attention to that and we have the option to treat it in an angle, it's fitting in more cases. And what I found that has been really cool about that is that in a lot of cases where I thought, okay, well, we're going to have to do a bone augmentation because we're, we're only within a millimeter and a half of the nerve because we're not having to bury it as much, then we're all of a sudden we've got three, four millimeter um, room above the above the nerve, which we have our, then our, a nice safety margin. So often it's like, okay, we can put this implant in and not have to do any grafting. So I think it's been really good that way. Uh, the other thing I like about the Astra system is the is their surgical kit. Um, I like the sleeve and sleeve system, and I've you know you know all of my implant cases over the years having used multiple different guided systems. We're always, because I'm lecturing a lot on implants, I'm always showing my cases and we're showing, okay, this is what it was planned and this is where the implant went. And I do notice that, um, you know, while we're always have been quite accurate that way, it is amazing how accurate is where my planned is and where my implant goes with that sleeve and sleeve system. And I think it's just because we're locking the sleeves together so tight that there is a lot less play uh, for the movement of the of the burr and you're able to easily much easier get the burr into the mouth to be able to place it so i think uh for me this system has been the has been the way we're we're working yeah and, and that's been my experience as well just to elaborate a little further on the profile implant system for those listeners who may not be familiar with it um, it tapers off towards one side whereas the opposing side of the implant head is still flat so the ideal scenario in my practice, Mike, has been exactly what you described, lower molar where the buckle bone has really sloped off. And rather than having to do an osteotomy to flatten that off, you can utilize that uh, profile angled implant. And of course, more information on the upcoming webinar as well. So the patient has had the opportunity to see their jawbone in the CBCT. We've gone over the anatomy and mapped it out, the anatomy that we want to avoid. We can actually outline it in a different color on the CBCT. And we've shown the patient the ideal implant placement position. How do we then fabricate a surgical guide? Tell our listeners about the two mechanisms uh, that you currently employ. Well, I'll, I'll just say that there's three methods actually um, that, that are possible. Typically, yes, exactly. We use two methods, um, but the first method uh, well, I'll talk about is the method that we're not often using, especially for single implants. But the first method would be to send your scans or your impressions to a lab. 
Um, you could send it to CCAT. You could send it to um, you know any one of the local labs, or you could send it to Simplant, and you basically get a guide coming back from one of these companies for your case. For multiple implants or for cases uh, where you don't have distal you know distal teeth for support of the guide, scenarios where you're you're not comfortable with with your guide and you want extra help on the design. Sending it to an outboard lab that can help you with the design and the positioning of your implant is great. And so there is that tool. But what we're talking about here in our system is we're looking at these single implant cases, maybe two implants or, you know, three, six, four, six missing. And these can all be done very easily with our workflow in office. And in that system, the two ways that we're doing it is either 3D printing the guide or we're doing it with milling it. And when we're milling it, we're milling it out of a block of acrylic, and it's either through the CIRAC MCXL milling mm -hmm. system or with the new prime mill. Um, then once we have that milled out, it's about a 45 minute task, um, we're ready to go. Um, the surgical uh, printing of it with a 3D printer, um, it's about 45 minutes. So it is a, it, or sorry, so the surgical guide two hours printing ahead. is about, yeah, two hours. So um, we're often using the milling. You know, so if you said, okay, what are you using? We're, we're milling. Now, why would we use the 3D printer over the milling? Well, there is a cost savings there for sure. But um, some people may not have the system. So I think, you know, 3D printing is a nice way to get into guide manufacturing when you don't have the milling chamber. So I think there is very, you know, there is good um, uses of it. And we're definitely using it and researching on it and looking at accuracy of 3D guided, um, you know, 3D printed guides as well. But for, for us currently, we're just sent it to the milling chamber 45 minutes later, we're, we're ready to roll. And so, yeah, obviously in our upcoming webinar, we're going to be discussing those two mechanisms uh, in detail. One, of course, is printing. Uh, the other one is uh, milling. And uh, we will briefly touch base on what you need to do if you, for example, don't have a CBCT or milling or 3D printing capability. So just to summarize, Mike, uh, the printing and the milling, it takes you about how long? Well, the milling uh, is is 45 minutes. And, you know, I would assume, you know, sorry, 3D printing is two hours. The milling is 45 minutes. But I'll assume, you know, with the new prime mill, that might be even faster. Yeah, it, it should be. Um, although the delivery of every unit in Canada has been a bit delayed due to COVID-19. So there may be a very, very small select number of dentists in Canada who have their prime mill. Uh, it's unlikely that any have been installed or have had a chance to use them yet. But, uh, you know, we're obviously still waiting on ours. I, I kind of compare it to the feeling that, you know, you're a nine-year-old kid. It's Christmas Eve. You're really excited about opening your new toy on Christmas. And all of a sudden, your regional dental body tells you that Christmas has been indefinitely postponed because Santa came down with a highly virulent uh, infection. So maybe that's not a very good analogy, but uh, nonetheless, the prime mill should certainly be faster. So what you're saying is for Christmas, you want a prime mill and all the Tiger King wants is two front teeth. <laughs> yeah, you know what? He might want a presidential pardon to go along with those front teeth as well, that, Mike. That's true. Yeah. Um, well, that concludes our podcast for today. Please join us next week where Mike and I will be discussing one visit dentistry utilizing CERAC technology. Uh, and, you know, we'll also discuss whether digital dentistry can help us determine whether Carol Baskin uh, fed her husband to the tigers, Mike. Wouldn't that be interesting to know? Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll see you all next week. Please subscribe and comment and be well.